Oh, hello. <laughs> no big deal. I uh, just doing a little video today outside of New York City in the uh, Hamptons. <laughs> Ever heard of them? Yeah, I didn't think so. Well, anyways, uh, I'm here in a cemetery in uh, Sag Harbor. Yeah, I know it's not the most glamorous part of the Hamptons, but Sag Harbor is a really amazing historic town here. Uh, you wouldn't really realize that uh, the Hamptons is a little more than just, uh, you know, douchey cocktail parties and overpriced mansions. It's actually got a lot of history, a lot of really cool stories, and Sag Harbor is kind of the center of it. We're going to be doing a little tour today of it. And uh, yeah, I realize this is a cemetery, but there's some cool stories here. But we're going to be walking into town and going through all the history of this really, really cool little uh, town. And uh, before we start, just uh, real quick, you know, go ahead and give it a like. You know, you're going to like this video anyway. Give it a little uh, subscribe. That really helps. And also, please check out my Patreon. Uh, that's what helps me uh, make these uh, silly old videos. But uh, I've got a lot of stuff to cover today. It's going to be pretty amazing. I don't know. It's a pretty nice day in the Hamptons. Well, let's go. <laughs> hey. So we're walking here next to Oakland Cemetery. This was actually built in 1840. Uh, it houses a lot of the most prominent citizens here in uh, Sag Harbor. It was built because the old burying ground, which we'll see a little later, started to get too full. Some of the famous people who uh, are inhabiting well, not inhabiting, they're just buried here, they're dead, are, um, let's see, Clay Felker, who founded the New York Magazine, George Ballantyne, the famous uh, ballet choreographer, he actually founded, helped found the New York City Ballet, uh, a man named Captain David Hand, the very famous uh, whaling captain, who's buried there with his five wives. He actually has an inscription on his tombstone that he wrote that says, Behold ye living, passing by, how thick the partners of one husband lie. Which uh, I guess in like modern English translates to uh, check out all my chicks. Also to check out this cool house here. That's the Ephraim Niles Byram house. So this guy was like an astronomer. He was a clockmaker. That's what that tower is for. He kept pendulums and clocks and things there. He made the clock for a famous library here. He made the clock at West Point. He made a clock at New York City Hall in New York actually. Pretty cool, he was kind of like a weird, eccentric guy. That's kind of the house where all the parents were like, yeah, kids, don't walk over there too late at night. He's kind of a weirdo. But he was actually a very, very genius dude. But a beautiful house. So uh, Sag Harbor, just so you guys know, is a very, very, obviously a very historic town, but it's got its roots in whaling. And we're gonna talk about all that, but a lot of the cottages and houses we're gonna be seeing on this walk date back to whaling. And just so you guys know, the whaling industry here kind of hit its peak in the first half of the 1800s, all the way to kind of the mid 1800s. And then it started to kind of decline. We'll talk about all that as we go. But you can see some of these little cottages here to my left. It's a bright day. It's nice. So Sag Harbor, actually the word, the name, actually is rooted in the Sagapon, which is a, a tuber that was actually uh, used by the Native Americans who lived here before it was settled. The Sagapon, a tuber, by the way, is a little weird word, tuber, but it's a, actually a, uh, it's like a root that you eat, like a potato is a root. Like if you put it, if you just let a potato sit too long, it'll start growing plants. Uh, I know that from experience, sadly. Uh, but anyways, Sag Harbor, Sagapon. But here, over here to the right, you have next to me is Otter Pond. This is called Otter Pond because there are actually otters here. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are no more otters there because what happened was, and we'll walk over the bridge here in a bit, a man named John Germain, who is a Revolutionary War hero, actually, here, has a library named after him. We'll talk about him in a little bit. He actually had this connected to the sound through a little ditch. Uh, he dug a ditch, and so now it's not a fresh water anymore. It's actually salt water mixed in there. So it's no waters, unfortunately. That was done in 1793. So we'll keep walking here. Hope we don't get run over by a car. Pretty nice little pond though. So over here on the left is gonna be Mishashamuit Park. Uh, it means at the Great Spring. Uh, it's actually been a park since 1910. It was started as a park by a woman we're gonna to talk to in a little bit. We're gonna not talk to, I wish, she's dead. So we're not gonna to talk to her. But she actually donated this park in 1910. Ready to cross? Let's do it. Come on. We did it, we didn't get hit. All right, so this is the little pond here, Otter Pond. And we're gonna be walking up Main Street, by the way all the way up until like the center of town. Uh, 
Yeah, there's no one around right now, so I don't have my mask on. Okay, so relax. I'll put it on once we get into town. Uh, you can see a little Christmas tree. This is actually like a tradition. They put a little Christmas tree in the middle of Otter Pond every year. Um, and we're going to be walking on Main Street. So a little bit of history of Sag Harbor. This area started to be settled uh, all the way like the 1600s. Uh, in fact, a lot of colonists up from uh, Massachusetts started making their way down here. Uh, so in the mid 1600s and around that time, there were mostly Native Americans here. And with the encroachment of the colonists, they started to basically become tribes to kind of protect themselves a little bit because they saw the writing on the wall. The main language groups, the main na nation, the nation was the Algonquin nation, but the language groups in this area were the Montauket and the Shinnecox. Yeah, Shinnecox. Yeah, grow up. Okay, Shinnecox. But uh, anyways, they were the ones who were here and they, uh, they, they stayed here for a little while longer, but then they really kind of made a settlement here in 1707. Uh, over here to the right, actually, you're going to see the World War I Memorial. There's this neighborhood, this town has some World War I history. In fact, the E.W. Bliss Company tested torpedoes in Sag Harbor, uh, and they were finding torpedoes that hadn't detonated in rockets or whatever, the underground rock, uh, underwater rockets. They were finding them, you know, decades after World War I in the actual harbor. Here's the uh, actual memorial. So we're walking up Main Street now. This is Main Street, and this is going to take us all the way into the center of town. So I was saying that the history of this neighborhood, of this town, I'm sorry. And you can see also, too, the houses over here on my left. These are a, a lot of these houses date back to when this was a whaling town. So this town really kind of hit its heyday when whaling hit its heyday. Now, to give you an idea of what whaling was in this uh, town, the Native Americans even whaled here in the 1700s and, and also the early colonists. But the way they did it was they would see whales off of the coast and they would just go out there in a boat and kill the whales and come back. But as the whales basically caught on, it became harder to do that. The whales are like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to hang around Sag Harbor anymore. Let's just go a little further into the ocean. So people started to get boats and head out to catch the whales. And the reason they wanted whales was because before petroleum, before coal, before other ways of getting, uh, you know, oil, that was a way to light lamps. That was a way to, uh, you know, lubricate machinery. That was a way to do lots of different things. It was a very, very important. Now the heyday of whaling in this town was actually pretty short lived. They didn't really set out to their, for their first deep sea whaling expe expedition until the early 1800s, like 1817. And then it kind of died down by the mid 1800s. In fact, a lot of people mark the gold rush in California as the big turning point of whaling industry here. And during that whaling, I guess, heyday, this whole town was pretty much dedicated to the whaling industry. You had all these different uh, boats and captains and different, uh, I guess, uh, industries dedicated to whaling, like the, they would make the food, they would make the, the tools, the harpoons, the, everything for this actual industry. Another thing is this neighborhood, this town, I keep saying neighborhood, it's so ridiculous, it's not a neighbor, it's a town. Tom, get it right. This town actually has a really deep literary history. And the reason is because of all the history and how beautiful it is. We're right on the water. It's so funny because people uh, consider the Hamptons to really be where all the you know, bankers and like rich people go with their fancy mansions, and that's true, but it's also got a lot of history. This is where, this is kind of the heart of it too in Sag Harbor. Think of like Greenwich Village in New York or the French Quarter in New Orleans, places like that, that really kind of hold all the history or, or carry a lot of that history. But this, on this little pond here is where uh, Steinbeck had his cabin and he had a little a little like tiny cabin called, he called Joyous Guard. It was like this little, uh, like octagonal little hut in the backyard that overlooked the water where he would do a lot of his writing. Joyous Guard named after the Lancelot Castle uh, and you know, all those books. You guys know, if you guys know on John Steinbeck, he wrote the book Travels with Charlie, which actually started here in Sag Harbor. He left his house here in Sag Harbor to embark on that uh, trip with his dog, Charlie in his RV, but you can see all these little cottages and everything. And I was telling you that this area had, has a rich literary history. Over here to the left, you have Canio's Books. This bookstore was founded in 1980 by Canio Pavone, and uh, he was actually friends with a man named Nelson Algren, who wrote a book called Man with a Golden Arm. Uh, Frank Sinatra was in the movie version of it. 
but he, he founded this bookstore in 1980 and it was taken over in 1999 by two women who bought it. And it was a really cool little neighborhood bookstore. And one of the women who, who took it over said that the turning point, one of the reasons she decided to invest in it was because when she used to go to it, one time she went to a movie screening there and the movie projector wasn't working. And because it wasn't working, one of the women in the group said, you know what, let's just go over to my house and watch it. And she thought that was a really like impressive, you know, like a nice little gesture of the community that it created. And she wanted to be kind of a part of that. So they own it now. And people who've done readings there include like Kurt Vonnegut, Margaret Atwood, uh, a lot of famous writers. And over here you have Glover Street, which is a lot where a lot of these famous writers from this town or who've been in this town have lived, including uh, James Fenimore Cooper, one of the sons of this town. He actually was involved in the whaling industry. He actually invested in a whaling ship called the Union. Uh, he was, he wrote, you know, the Leather Stocking Tales. You guys know who he is? One of the first great American authors. He wrote uh, Last of the Mohicans. And Natty Bumpo, who was like the, one of the main characters of the Leather Stocking Tales, is actually based on Captain David Hand, who we talked about at uh, the cemetery. Man, look at this. I'm just wrapping all this together. What a small world, huh? Ah! So we're walking up uh, Main Street. We're seeing a lot of these different houses. One of the cool things about such an old town is that you have lots of different architectural styles all mixed in here. A lot of them dating back to when this was a whaling town, and they've all been preserved. Over here to the left, you have a really good example of a Greek revival house. This is called L'Amadou. This house looks like it could be in Greenwich Village uh, in New York, which, by the way, I've done a Greenwich Village video. Sick plug. <laughs> it is kind of chilly here, I'm not gonna lie. But we're gonna walk by some other houses here. But over there on Glover Street, which we just walked by, is also, was also where uh, Nelson Algren lived. Also, uh, Betty Friedan. Ooh. Betty Friedan, if you guys know who she is, she wrote uh, Feminine Mystique in 1963. Uh, uh, probably one of the most important feminist books ever written. It kind of uh, dispelled the myth that women were completely fulfilled by just being housewives. It was, she was kind of one of the first people to really show that women were more than just, you know, cooks. And that was 1963. It took a little bit of a, still taking a little bit of time for that to sink in for people. So over here on the left, you're gonna see one of these houses. So this house here is actually called the Howell Napier House, back when the old whaling days. But on top, you see this little balcony that's known as what's called a uh, widow's walk. Kind of dark, a little sad. That's where actually, you know, women would go. Well, what they say was it was for it. Women would go up there and they would pace around waiting for the, you know, ship to come into harbor so they could run and meet their loved ones. I guess it's kind of kind of hard to imagine, but back then, uh, whaling ships, whaling expeditions, as they went further and further out into the ocean, they were gone for years on end. Years. Imagine you're saying goodbye to your son or your husband and it's going to be three years until he comes back, if he comes back at all. And sometimes, oftentimes, they wouldn't come back at all. So you never get any closure, they just disappear. Your husband's gone forever. So people would lose their minds and they'd walk on their widow's walk and kind of, you know, talk to themselves, I guess. And, what not? Pretty cool though. I mean, uh, it was really a big deal whenever there was a, a whaling expedition, whenever the expedition actually came back, the whole town would go converge on Long Wharf, which we're gonna see a little later, uh, to welcome back the, the, the sailors and hear the stories and see what they got. So whaling was a huge deal here in the first half of the 1800s. I was telling you guys that before. In fact, I, I forgot to mention this when we were at the, when we were at the Oakland Cemetery. But at the Oakland Cemetery, there is a broken mast monument, which is a, uh, it was built in 1856 to commemorate all the people who died at sea whaling. I keep talking about the whaling here because it's really kind of what made this, this town prosperous and what built these houses, these pretty houses, and what gave it kind of its fame. Um, it's important to keep in mind. And one of the reasons is because of the actual harbor itself. In fact, the whaling had started initially a little bit to the east of here. But as the whaling ships got bigger, the deeper harbors here made it more amenable to whaling. All right, so here to the right, you have the Van Scoy House. This is actually a federal house from the year 1810. Now it's called federal because this style of architecture was popular in the colonies after the American Revolution and the early Americans, once the revolution was over, which the United States won, by the way, no hard feelings, Britain, <laughs> okay. They changed the name of the Georgian style architecture to federal. It was kind of a similar thing. 
So that's a federal style, really pretty house. And then over here to the left, you have a really cool building. This building here is the Whalers Museum here in uh, Sag Harbor. This building here actually dates back to 1845. It's a beautiful Greek revival architecture uh, style building. Um, it was actually owned by a woman named Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage, whose husband, Russell Sage, uh, bequeathed her uh, about $2 billion in today's money. It's a lot of dough, and she used it to fund lots and lots of uh, philanthropic pursuits around the city, including Shasham Hewitt Park. She also did uh, the Pearson School, which is a high school and, and uh, a middle school here close by. And also this here. This is the John Germain Memorial Library. Uh, very beautiful Beaux-Arts building. It was actually built in 1910. Beaux-Arts, like in New York City, huh? tons of Beaux-Arts, turn of the century, 1910. Look at that, huh? Anyways, the inside, the rotunda is actually uh, was designed by, man, uh, by a man's company named Guastavino. You guys may know Guastavino from the municipal building in New York. You may know him from Grand Central Terminal, the piling that he does. Grand Central Terminal, which I did a video on. Huh? Sick plug. Across. Hopefully we don't get run over. All right, let's go. So over here on the right, you're going to have the Hannibal French House. This is a beautiful house from 1845. It was actually designed by Menard Lefebvre. Uh, you may not know that name, but you may have recognized his stuff from New York City. He designed uh, Snug Harbor, which was actually a home for uh, aging sailors in uh, Staten Island, New York City. He also designed St. Anne's in uh, Brooklyn Heights. You can see that in my Brooklyn Heights video. <laughs> Sick plug. And over here, this is a really cool building. With a good story. This here is the Customs House. This dates back to 1790. Back when the United States was a young country, we're talking right after the Revolution, Sag Harbor was the busiest port in the United States, even busier than New York City. So after the Second Continental Congress, the United States had to pick an official port of entry and they chose Sag Harbor because this is where the United States would get most of its revenue, customs. So this was the Customs House. It was actually located closer to the port, but uh, you know they moved it because it actually started to fall into disrepair in the mid-1900s. And this man named Charles Edison, he has another name Thomas Edison, he said, hey, I have some property, I have some money, I'll help you guys, and uh, they moved it over to his property. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's a little bit of a sun and changing light. I have my trusty camera person. Wink. She's doing a great job. And then over here to the right, you have the Masonic Temple on top. Masonic Temple is kind of creeping me out, but it's up there on the second floor. It's been there for a very long time, too. The Whaling Museum also puts on art exhibitions. I pulled a few strings and was able to speak to a local artist. So I'm here with Sabina Streeter, who's a local artist. She's been here in the neighborhood for a very long time. What about Sac Harbor is appealing to artists in particular? The, the other Hamptons were already incredibly expensive, and Sac Harbor had still sort of little nooks and crannies mm -hmm. where you could rent something for not that much money. Right, and, right. And, and that's slowly starting to change, I imagine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, brother. <laughs> Yikes. Cut. So what's your favorite part of Sag Harbor? Well, I love the Whaling Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, like. I had a couple of exhibitions there. Right. I had a show at the, the Heritage East. House. Well, I had the shows of 19th century portrait of iconic uh, mm -hmm. heroes while he was in Eastmore. And that was based on tin types of uh, residents uh, of Sac Harbor in the 19th century. Eastmore was very diverse. It was African American, Native American, mm -hmm. um, European immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I'm a kind of an artist myself. Uh, I, I tend to, to dabble in the visual arts. I made, oh. a, I made a little piece here. Actually, I wanted to, uh, to show you, see what you thought. It's nothing big. It's just, uh, you know, this guy, John Steinbeck. <laughs> you know, what, what do you think of that? It's minimalistic, but you captured his spirit. You hear that? It's... I captured his spirit. So is there anything you're working on right now that you want to uh, plug? Uh, <laughs> I am now... Uh, working on a series of shipwrecks. Oh, cool, shipwrecks. shipwrecks, that's great. There are a lot of shipwrecks yeah, on sure. the East Coast here. So um, that is probably going to be in an exhibition in the near future. That's great. You know, on, uh, on my videos, I usually promote my stuff. And when I do that, I say, sick plug. You want to try saying that real quick? No. <laughs> OK, perfect. <laughs> and over here in the Whalers uh, Museum lot, you have a little boat. You'll see the whaling boat, which I want to show you. This little boat here 
is what the boats would look like. So the way you actually capture whales back then, you would do this, is you would take a huge ship, a ship, a whaling ship out to sea. Now these things were built like tankers because that's what they were. They were basically storing whale oil. The way you would catch the whales though, is you would have whaling boats that would be lowered every time you would see a whale. So you'd have these people up in the crow's nest and they would spot a whale off in the distance and they would yell the famous phrase, there she blows. That was like a really good accent and like a character I just created right there. I could be in like a Moby Dick recreation or something. Yeah, it's no big deal. I'm like an actor and stuff. Here to the right, you have the Captain Hulbert house. It's houses like these that were where the captains lived. So the captain was kind of the big wig. Then you had the harpooners. Uh, you had the, uh, you know, the, the, the steerers. They had, people had all their different uh, roles. You had cabin boys who were usually kids who just kind of did everything. Uh, all kinds of like, you know, you had the first mate, second mate, third mate who would all help the captain. And back then, you know, these, these people, captains were oftentimes like, you know, 30 years old, 29, 28. They weren't super old. People didn't live super long in these kind of worlds. Um, so like 29, 28, that's like really, that's like five years from now for me. So I wouldn't be old enough to be a captain because I'm like 24. Here to the right, you have the Stephen French house. He was a shipping magnate who was involved in politics. And this is where Chester A. Arthur used to summer. Chester A. Arthur, the, uh, you know, the president of the United States. He's the guy who actually helped dedicate the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. It is kind of interesting though that the, this, this town has such a deep uh, revolutionary war and patriotic history. In fact, during the revolutionary war, this town was completely overrun uh, by the British. Everyone was booted out, all the patriots left. They went to Connecticut, they went to upstate New York, they left, because if you remember from the Battle of Long Island, which I've talked about in other videos, I talked about it in the Brooklyn Heights video, sick plug again. <laughs> um, the British took over New York City and made that their headquarters. They also took over the rest of Long Island. Uh, but there was one successful battle here called Meigs Raid. Uh, this guy named Jonathan Meigs came in to the harbor uh, from Connecticut and basically, you know, captured a bunch of British people in 1777. Pretty big deal. Oh. Uh, speaking of which, we should actually turn around and check this thing out. I want to show you guys something over here. We forgot to do it. This is all off the cuff, so, uh, you know, take it easy. I want to show you guys something here on Union Street that I forgot to walk over to. There's also War of 1812 history here. The War of 1812, there was a small... So, just so you guys know, New York City learned its lesson from the American Revolution. It fortified itself. They put, you know, built multiple forts. Fort Wood, which is what the Statue of Liberty is located on. They built... Uh, they built Castle Clinton, Castle Williams. But here they fortified themselves too. And there was actually a raid, an attempted uh, invasion here by the British that was knocked away. It was actually pretty successful, uh, you know, for the, the soldiers here. They, it's a point of pride here, across here. One of the famous things about the War of 1812 is that that's where the United States got its uh, national anthem. The Star Spangled Banner. The Star Spangled Banner was written by Francis Scott Key. Uh, he was inspired by the bombing that he witnessed in Maryland. You guys know the Star Spangled Banner is like, Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. That was pretty good. But you can start seeing some of the uh, actual uh, monument for Jonathan Miggs, Colonel Miggs, for the Battle of Sag Harbor, 1777. I already talked about that. And then over here to the right, You'll see something really cool. This is the Whalers Church. This dates back to 1843. And on top you can see the uh, little like blubber blades. Those are actual blades that they use to carve blubber off the whales. It's a real whaling uh, history. It's also like an Egyptian revival style architecture, which is pretty cool. They don't have that very often in, uh, in the United States. So it's pretty cool style. Also used to have a steeple that was 185 feet high. And you could see it from anywhere in the city. And uh, that actually fell down during the hurricane of 1938. Uh, it was a Category 3 storm, just so you guys know. That's a pretty big deal, considering that, like, Hurricane Sandy in New York City in 2012, that wasn't, that wasn't even a Category 1, and it pretty much, you know, destroyed Lower Manhattan, flooded the entire city, and that's Category 3 here. It was a pretty big deal. Okay, now we can keep walking. We're just walking around, guys. That's the whole idea. It's not this, like, manicured, fancy thing, you know, just totally gorilla style Okay, so what I was talking about too with the whaling, this is an important point about Sag Harbor that makes it very unique too in the Hamptons, 
it has a very diverse history because whaling was diverse, because whaling was so dangerous, because whaling was so open to whoever was, you know, crazy enough to take those missions and take that work. You know, as long as you weren't afraid, as long as you were good at what you did, they accepted all kinds. So escaped slaves, a lot of African Americans, uh, Native Americans, South Americans who came back, Pacific Islanders who made it onto these ships in some way. Um, so here in Sag Harbor, a, an African American community developed fairly early uh, in, in comparison to the rest of the country. It's actually right near here, it's called Eastville. Let's go there now. So I'm here at the Eastville Community Historical Society Heritage House, in case you don't read this giant sign behind me. But this area is an almost exclusively black neighborhood here in Sag Harbor that has been so since the mid-1800s when whalers, who were all kinds of ethnicities, would buy their land here. And it was actually open to them, which was a big deal back then. Uh, in fact, here at Nineveh, Azarest, and Sag Harbor Hills, you have waterfront communities that since the mid-1900s were open to black people, which is a big deal. Uh, because black families were able to come here and own a piece of the American dream and vacation with their families and see other successful black families. Uh, and that was a big deal here in Long Island and in the United States. In fact, here in Long Island in the mid-1900s, there were lots of suburban communities sprouting up for soldiers returning from World War II, but almost all of them were exclusively for white families. So this was a big exception. Now, in the mid-1800s, when they started settling in this area, the black people and the Native Americans were still segregated out of other places uh, in Long Island. So here at the St. David AME Zion Church, they started their own church in 1840 uh, to cater to them, and that is also still here. But this is a really, really cool neighborhood, and this actual uh, heritage house is a very important part of this community. It holds it at fish fry every year since the mid-80s. And it's a very, very close-knit community. But one more thing that makes Sag Harbor very different from other parts of Long Island and the United States. In fact, people like Langston Hughes, Duke Ellington, uh, Harry Belafonte have all come and summered here or hung out here. So, one more reason why the Hamptons isn't just, you know, A-Rod and J-Lo. Pretty cool, huh? All right, back to the tour. Oh my gosh, wasn't that super cool? OMG, so cool. All right, well, that's some production quality, production value that I'm trying to add here. I'm gonna put on my mask now because we're entering into town, but uh, we're now entering into kind of the downtown area of Sag Harbor. And this is the area of town where back in, you know, the first half of the 1800s, people would be running around. There'd be smells of cooking blubber and horses and all kinds of, you know, just complete insanity here. Now also to keep in mind, this is an interesting thing to keep in mind about Sag Harbor, that the, the town's fortunes started to dip after whaling left. So after whaling left, you know, they tried their hand in industry and some industries popped up. There's a watch case factory, old watch case factory that opened in 1881 right around the corner. That was open until uh, the 1930s and then it became a Bulova uh, satellite office, one of the watches, and now it's gonna be luxury condos, baby, of course. Here to the left you have an old house. This is, this is old Admiral Stanton's house. He was an admiral in the Navy. To the right, you'll see the Latham house. The Latham house dates back to 1740. This house has a pool in the back. I just recently saw it listed on the real estate thing here. Seven, almost seven million dollars. Kind of nuts. Here to the left, you have the variety store. This is the five and ten, they call it, from 1922. But I can assure you, it's not five, it's not five and dime in there. I went to buy a few things the other day. I had to do a double, I do a spit take. This is $72 for just a handful of items. I saw the receipt and I was like, actually, can you put this water on that too? She rang it up, I drank a, a, a gulp of water and then I spit it out when I read it again. Here to the left is the Sag Harbor Cinema. This dates back to 1890. In the 1930s, a man named John Eberson, who was famous for building these giant theaters all over the country, redesigned it. You see the Art Deco sign and everything. And then it burnt down in 2016, and they rebuilt it just recently. It's kind of fancy pants in there now, but it's closed, unfortunately. There you can see what it says on the wharf shop here. You see it says Scrimshaw. Just so you guys know, Scrimshaw is actually like the art that you use to carve whale teeth and uh, make art. They actually have them at the Whalers Museum. Here to the left here, you have Marty's Barbershop. In that building, actually used to, used to live a man named Thomas Harris, an author. Ooh. Thomas Harris, famous for writing Silence of the Lambs. Ah, he lived there. That's where Hannibal Lecter was born, huh? Here's the municipal building. This was built in 1846. 
as was this hotel, the American Hotel in 1846. A great fire swept through here in 1845. So they built a lot of those buildings here around that time. That's also around the time that this became incorporated as an actual village. I love the like, it's so funny. Every time I do these things, people always give me the craziest looks. Walking around with this gimbal. People think I'm famous, I guess. <laughs> I'm not. So here too, you have Onda Beauty. So this is kind of the stuff that's kind of popping up. This is a, like a spa, like treatment, whatever, all that stuff. I've never even been to one of those places, but this one's owned partly by Naomi Watts, the actress. Ooh. Got a lot of celebs in this area too, in Sag Harbor today. We're kind of farther away from the actual beach though, the beach beach over on the Atlantic where people have their massive compounds and stuff. Here to the left, you have this Tutto Il Giorno. And that's a restaurant that was just recently opened by Donna Karen's daughter. Uh, so we're starting to get into the ritzier part of Sag Harbor. But the beautiful thing is that it's still kind of a, uh, an eclectic mix of people, somewhat. And that's something that the people here fight for. Uh, these are a lot of the issues that they're having in New York City as well. Uh, we've talked about gentrification in so many of the videos. That's something that even permeates places like this. You have the people who've been here for a long time trying to protect their way of life, the community. And it's not easy when you have tons and tons of money coming in and people who don't have a connection to the old way of life or whatever. And they're transient too. They don't live here year round. So they don't care if it's a certain way or not. They're just here to buy the property. So it's a struggle and it's something very important. People keep fighting for here. We're gonna cross, I guess. Over here to the right, you have the old mill that used to be a mill, actually. Over here on the right, Sag Harbor Mill. It used to also be where Grumman, a uh, aeronautics and, and a weaponry company, had their uh, factory. That's where they built part of the lunar module for the Apollo mission to the moon in 1969. Over here to the right, you have the Bay Street Theater. It's a cool little theater from the early 1990s. They're streaming their shows right now. Also, too, I forgot to mention that Herman Melville spent a lot of time in Sag Harbor, and he got the inspiration to write Moby Dick partly from here. Herman Melville used to, he's a New Yorker, he actually wore, used to work in the meatpacking district, which I talked about in the meatpacking uh, video. Sick plug. <laughs> you know, come on. Um, but also Starbucks was uh, based on the character Starbucks and Moby Dick over here to the left. You have this windmill here. It's a replica of the windmill that was located like 50 feet from here. Uh, and it was built in 1760. But the way the mill works is the wind would blow the mill around and inside there's a gear that turns and it just basically grinds wheat into flour. That's the whole idea of a mill. In case you didn't know that. I'm teaching everything, even science. Look at that, mechanics, baby. And if you go north, you get to North Haven, you get to Shelter Island, which you take a little ferry to. This is the Long Wharf. This has been here since the 1700s. It was extended in 1821 when whaling became bigger here. We're gonna go out there. It's a little, a little chilly. It's okay. Oh, and over here, right around the corner too, you have Billy Joel's house. Oh. Billy Joel, you guys know him, right? The piano man, come on. He lives right around here, right on the street. Uh, he's the guy who sings a song, uh, you know. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. Well, we're all in the mood for a melody. And you got us feeling all right. Oh, la, da, da. I'm just kidding. I gotta skip. I'll stop. I'll stop. So this is where the whaling ships used to leave from. This is where they used to park and a whaling ship would come back from its years long journey and people would rush to the ship to see what stories they'd come up with, who came back with them, who didn't come back with them. It's a pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing history here. And it's interesting because whaling was so important here. And when whaling declined in the mid 1800s, one of the reasons was the gold rush. A lot of sailors went over to try to find gold in California. Uh, different sources of oil, replaced whale oil. When that happened, the, the neighborhood started to decline. They had industry pop up here and there, things like the watch case factory, but it just kind of fell into decline and it never really kind of got the same like uh, reputation that it had when it was a whaling town. And that's kind of what's preserved this town. Uh, it's kind of been like a, like a weird little timing uh, that's kind of kept it, you know, depressed in a way uh, so that it never got taken over and built up fancy and everything and that's kind of what's preserved it today but today now there's pressure to build it up because people are so i guess enamored with the history and the the uh the beautiful architecture that today now they're fighting and hold, trying to hold on to that history that it uh that it's kind of taken so long to create but this is a really pretty awesome view here 
So we're kind of coming up here to the end of the tour pretty soon. You got a really great view here from Long Wharf. Like I said before, this all feeds into the Long Island Sound. We're at the north end of Long Island as opposed to the south end, which gives out to the Atlantic Ocean. That's where also all the massive mansions, you know, with people with their pools and all that stuff is located. People like J-Lo, OMG. <laughs> They all live out on those massive mansions in like East Hampton and South Hampton and Sagaponic, all that stuff. But here we go. We're here at the end of Long Wharf. This is sadly kind of getting to the end of the tour, guys. This is a really beautiful town, has a really rich history, very close connection with New York City. Um, but yeah, I don't know what to tell you. It's really, uh, oh, I do know what to tell you. You could uh, please subscribe. <laughs> That'd be great. And also, too, if you, if you enjoyed the video, please, 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 please check out my Patreon. I beg you. That really, really helps. I'm trying to grow this thing. I'm trying to keep going to other places outside of New York City. Um, there's so much to show and talk about, so much history. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. I'm a huge, you know, what some people would call a tool <laughs> for history. So that's fine. I'll, I'm happy to keep showing you guys other places as long as I can get out here. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what to tell you guys. We made it to the end here of Long Wharf. Um, you know. I'm gonna go see if I can go house shopping, maybe find a nice uh, dumpster. It only costs $5,000 a month. And uh, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. We did it, we did it. And it's a beautiful town, Sag Harbor. Come visit. It's not, uh, the Hamptons isn't what you think it is. They call Sag Harbor Unhampton, which is kind of funny because uh, it kind of dispels the notions of what people think the Hamptons are. So come out to Sag Harbor and take me with you. <laughs> okay, I'm really dragging this on. All right, I don't know what to tell you. I'm out of here. See ya. Sick. <laughs>